Hi, welcome back. We're going to pick up where we left off. So Child Protective Services, it's always called CPS, regardless of where you work or live. CPS caseworkers are employed by the county in New York State, though. So remember that CPS caseworkers are always county employees. So the SCR, the Statewide Central Register, is run by the state. So people who work for the SCR are state employees, and that is operated by the state. But actual CPS investigations are done by CPS workers who work for the county. And most counties require CPS caseworkers to abide by a residency requirement. You'll see that in a job posting this week. So usually in New York State, CPS caseworkers have to live within the county where they work. So therefore, CPS caseworkers are interviewing and investigating members of their own community. And there's some advantages to this. When CPS caseworkers work where they live, they know the area, they know the neighborhoods, they know how to get around, they know the schools, they know all the available resources that are there that can help people. But of course, there's some disadvantages. If CPS caseworkers have to live where they work, they're gonna run into people they're investigating or whose children they've removed from the home while they're shopping in the grocery store, dropping their kid off at school, or they're at some other location. So there's advantages and disadvantages for counties who have residency requirements. Albany County has a residency requirement for caseworkers. You can apply to be a CPS caseworker before you live in Albany County, but the day you are hired, you have to live within Albany County and you must remain living in Albany County for the entire time you're working as a CPS worker. You will see that in the job posting in this module. Let's talk about the CPS process. Now we are purposefully oversimplifying a very complex process. There are literally hundreds of regulations that dictate what CPS workers have to do and how they have to do it. But we're gonna simplify the process here just in terms of, just so we can discuss the basics of what CPS workers do. The first thing that happens in any CPS case in New York State is a member of the public or a mandated reporter has to call the SCR. There is no other way in New York State for a CPS case to get started. It must start by somebody calling the SCR. Let's say, for example, a social services worker walks out of the county building and sees someone physically beating their child. Well, of course, they're going to call 911. But to start a CPS investigation, even though they're a county CPS worker, they have to call the hotline. So that's very important to remember for both real life and for, I don't know, your final exam that CPS investigations in New York State must start with a call being made to the SCR. The second step is, of course, the SCR accepts the report and it forwards it to the appropriate county's CPS unit within 30 minutes. So as soon as the SCR has recorded that report in its system, it must forward it electronically to the appropriate county. The appropriate county depends on a couple different factors. It's usually where the child has their primary residence. That's what usually dictates it. But sometimes it could be a different county depending on if the primary parent lives in, say, Onondaga County, but the other parent lives in Monroe County and the kid goes back and forth. But generally speaking, the appropriate county is where the child's primary residence is located. Once the SCR has forwarded the report to the county, the county must acknowledge it. We certainly don't want to have anything drop through the cracks involving child abuse or neglect. So we want to make sure once the report is accepted, the county acknowledges receiving it. Once they've received the report, they have 24 hours to begin an investigation. And what they have to do in that first 20 hours, 24 hours may vary depending upon the allegations. For example, if the allegations are that a child has missed 36 days of school and is failing five of their classes, that investigation will probably begin with a phone, couple of phone calls, the CPS worker contacting the school, making sure they have the correct school and can access the child's educational records. And it may involve making a call to one or both of the parents to schedule a meeting. 
Now, if a case is that the father is holed up in the bathroom of a house with his two and his four-year-old child, he's been smoking meth all day and he has a shotgun and the police are outside and the SWAT team's outside trying to get him out of the house and get the children released, well, the CPS worker is going to contact law enforcement and law enforcement is going to tell that CPS worker where to locate themselves. So if they need the CPS worker to do an emergency removal or to work with those children right away, the CPS worker will be near the scene in a safe location waiting for instructions from police. And of course, CPS has to be open 24 hours. So that could mean responding to a call at four o'clock in the morning. The fourth step is once the CPS worker has begun their investigation with the 48 hours, then they really get the investigation going. They are required to meet the parents in person, they, even during COVID. They are required to meet the children in person. They are required several times to be inside of the home and actually view the home. And they're gonna gather a whole bunch of information that supports or refutes the allegations. It's interesting to note that parents are not required to cooperate with CPS. If a CPS worker knocks at a parent's door and when the parent opens, they say, hi, my name's Judy Smith and I'm a CPS worker with Albany County and I'm here because a report was made against you. The parent can slam the door in their face, right? They can simply slam the door in the face, say, I'm not talking to you. Don't call me. Leave me alone. We have constitutional rights when we're adults in this country. So there's no requirement in the law that parents have to cooperate with CPS. However, CPS also has its job to do and it has all its legal requirements it must meet. So if a parent refuses to cooperate in any way, will not let CPS even just view the children, um, that's going to be an issue and CPS is going to have to go to family court and obtain a court order that's then served on the parents that require the parents to let CPS see the children. So most, it's not the way we want it to go. It's already adversarial enough for a CPS worker to be trying to work with a parent. They certainly don't want to make it worse and CPS workers are very well trained in how to gain cooperation from families. So for example, that same caseworker on that porch trying to explain to the parent they have to investigate a report might say to the parent, ma'am, you do not have to cooperate with me. You're not required to, but this is what I have to do if you don't. I have to go to family court and I have to get a court order that's gonna be served on you by the sheriff and it's gonna require you to bring your children to court so I can talk to them. But we don't need to do all that. You can just send the kids out on the porch. I can say hi, make sure they're alive and well, and then you and I can make an appointment to meet at a later time. And caseworkers learn all kinds of techniques like that to get parents to cooperate. And most parents do at least some. They cooperate at least some. Most parents can be persuaded to at least work with CPS to ensure the immediate safety of the children. CPS interviews at school. CPS are allowed by law in New York State to interview children at school without the parent's permission or knowledge. This practice can be controversial and was in the news quite a bit in New York State just a couple of years ago. And parents object to this and I can understand their argument that they do not want a complete stranger showing up at their child's school and asking them personal questions about themselves and their family. However, it is absolutely necessary sometimes with some allegations that this is how CPS workers first approach kids. We learned when we were talking about domestic violence that police officers should separate adults and talk to them individually outside of the other's vision and earshot so they can get a more accurate picture of what's going on. The same applies to children. It's not going to be very effective for a CPS caseworker to ask a child if the parent's beating them while the parent's standing next to them. It's not really effective. So in some cases, due to the nature of the allegations, it's actually imperative that the CPS workers talk to the kids at school without the parent's knowledge. 
but it is controversial and I understand why. I do understand why parents object to that. This is an invasive process. Child Protective Services by its nature is quite invasive. If you invite a CPS caseworker into your home, they are going to do a thorough inspection of your home. They're going to look at all of the sleeping areas, including the adults. They're going to want to see where every child sleeps. And that doesn't mean peeking in through the doorway. That means actually coming into the child's room. They're going to want to assess the cleanliness of the entire living space. They're going to want to see that there's an adequate amount of food in the home. So that's going to mean parents opening their cabinets and showing caseworkers how much food they have. They're going to look at the toilet and the sink and the tub and the shower area to make sure there's running water and all those facilities work. They're basically going to look at all living areas throughout the house. It is invasive. However, you learned in the module we did on child neglect about the minimum standard of care and child protective caseworkers are just that. They're about protecting children. So if they're invited into a parent's home, they're going to ensure that the minimum degree of care is being met for food, clothing, and shelter. CPS workers also interview non-family members. CPS caseworkers can talk to neighbors, relatives, teachers, and all types of other people. Now, of course, the CPS caseworker is prohibited from disclosing personal information about the family. It would be inappropriate and even against the law for a caseworker to say to a neighbor, hey, we think your neighbor Mark has a drinking problem. Have you ever seen him drunk? Okay, that, that would be a violation of confidentiality. However, a caseworker can knock on the neighbor's door and say, hi, I'm working with the family next door. Do you have any concerns about the children? And the neighbor can say, no, I don't think the kids are fine or I never even see those kids. Or they can say things that they've heard or observed. So the CPS caseworker is not going to provide a lot of personal information about the family. However, they're going to invite non-family members, including neighbors, relatives, teachers, and other people to provide information to them. The exception to this is if a CPS caseworker wants to interview a medical provider, including a doctor, a dentist, a mental health professional, anyone who's a medical staff member, they have to obtain a HIPAA release. And I'm sure you're all familiar with those. We've all signed a million of them, right? So if a CPS caseworker wants medical records or wants to interview a medical care provider, then they have to get a HIPAA release from the parents. But CPS caseworkers have wide latitude in the law and in regulations to do a lot of interviews and conduct a lot of activity with or without the parent's permission. Services. CPS is required by law to offer services to the parent, the child, or the entire family. And those services could be any services that resolve or alleviate any problems they're having. Now, the examples of services that could be offered are wide, and it also depends on the county, right? Some counties have more services available than others. But the services CPS are required to offer, of course, are relevant to that particular family, but could include drug and alcoholism counseling, mental health therapy or counseling, medical care, dental care, educational services, drug or alcohol evaluations, psychological evaluations. It could, you know, marriage counseling. It could be any list of services you could possibly think of. So CPS is required to identify what services they think could help a family, and they're required to offer them. Note the italics on the word offer. They can't make parents do something. Parents can refuse to accept the services. They can say, I don't want to have a drug or alcohol evaluation. My child is not going to get psychological care. They can refuse the offer. If CPS wants to force a family to participate in services, the only way they can do that is by getting a court order from family court. And we'll talk about that towards the end of the module. So they're required to offer services but of course, they have no power to make a parent participate in services or a child for that matter. If they want to have some force to the effect of the services, they have to obtain a court order from family court. 
then if the parents violate the order, they have to deal with the judge. There's additional help out there for CPS. You may have heard of child advocacy centers, often called CACs. They're located in most counties in New York State. We know that being interviewed by strangers can be very traumatic for children, especially when they're being interviewed by very personal things. Now, it's probably not very traumatic for a stranger, a CPS worker, to interview a child about why they're missing school or um, why they're not, you know, if they've been, you know, have you seen the doctor lately or did you go to the dentist this year? That stuff's not really invasive or personal to kids. However, we know that sometimes CPS caseworkers are investigating very serious cases and very serious allegations, such as severe physical abuse and sexual abuse. And when uh, CPS workers are very well trained in interviewing children, but when the allegations are the most serious, such as about sexual abuse, it requires specific training. So there may be CPS workers who don't do interviews with children about sexual abuse. Only the caseworkers specifically trained to do that do those interviews. And we also have people employed by child advocacy centers who've received a lot of training and usually have a degree in social work or child psychology. And they're called forensic interviewers. And they're taught how to interview children in a way that they still get factual information, but they don't further traumatize the child by the interview. So forensic interviewers can lessen the traumatic effect on children of being interviewed. And of course, when cases are have the most serious allegations like sexual abuse or severe physical abuse, the police are gonna get involved and the district attorney is gonna wanna get involved. And we've learned over the years that this can be extremely harmful and traumatizing children to have a social worker interview, then the CPS caseworker, then a police officer, then the district attorney. It's too much for children. And they also find that children can get more and more confused every time they're interviewed. So it's really best to have a person specifically trained to interview children about matters such as sexual abuse and to only interview them once or maybe twice. So child advocacy centers have rooms that are very friendly and, and warm for children. And they have two-way mirrors. So as you can see in the photograph, you have the woman in the burgundy shirt and the man in the gray sweater. They're observing the interview through a one-way mirror. So the child and the forensic interviewer cannot see the people in the other room. They also use cameras and they have audio equipment. So these people not only are seeing the interview, they can hear and record everything that's being said. So the police officer can get all the information he or she needs. The district attorney can get all the information he or she needs without interviewing the child multiple times. If they want to ask the child a specific question, the forensic interviewer will take a break go and talk to these other people and the district attorney might say, can you please ask this question? Or the police officer may say, could you ask this question, but ask it in a different way? And then the forensic interviewer can continue the interview and ask those specific questions. So there are child advocacy centers in our area. And I um, suggest that you look those up online if you have more interest in about what these uh, agencies do and the services they offer. Forensic interviewing is just one of many services that they offer. Another source of help for CPS are what's called multidisciplinary teams or MDTs for short. Most counties in New York have MDTs and these are groups made up of law enforcement officers, social workers, DSS workers, lawyers, medical professionals, teachers, all different types of people from different professions who have different areas of expertise. And they can meet and confidentially have a conversation about a specific case and figure out how best to address that child's problem. Of course, these types of teams are only working with the most serious cases and oftentimes they're reviewing fatalities. So when a child has died, 
And whether it's a homicide by the parent or the child dies as an accident involving the parent, these teams can examine everything about that case with all their different areas of expertise and their different perspectives and go through that entire case and try to figure out if anything could have been done differently so it can be done differently the next time or maybe even prevent a homicide or serious crime from occurring against a child. So step five in our CPS process is they have to conclude the investigation and the law only gives them 60 days to do it. So whatever the caseworker wants to do, interview the teacher, get medical records from the doctor, talk to the neighbors, talk to the parents, interview the children, get one of the children forensically interviewed at a CAC, try to convince the parents to get drug tests. The, everything the CPS worker wants to do they got 60 days to do it. And as you can imagine, those 60 days go by pretty quickly. Once those 60 days have passed, the caseworker has to make a decision. And in New York State, they only have two options. One is they can indicate the case. Indicating the case means there was some credible evidence. The allegations were true. That is the legal standard, some credible evidence. The only other option is to unfound the case. And that means they found no credible evidence the allegations were true. There's a lot of things they can't do. They can't say, well, we're not going to issue a decision because we need more time. The law doesn't allow for that. They have 60 days to indicate the case or unfound the case. That's their only two options. When a report is indicated by CPS, it remains in the SCR database. Remember, the state runs the SCR, the county conducts the investigation, so there is some level of working together here. So the SCR database will maintain an indicated report from CPS. And what happens with this is it may have an adverse impact on the adult who wants to obtain a job working with children in any field that has substantial involvement with children. It may also have an adverse impact on them becoming a foster parent or on them adopting a child. And there is an appeals process that provides an opportunity to get the indicated report removed from the SCR database. So here's all of our CPS process put together. The member of the public or a mandated reporter must make a call to the SCR. There is no CPS investigation in New York State unless someone has made a call to the SCR. And step two, the SCR has accepted the report. Once the SCR accepts the report, they forward it to the appropriate county, usually the, where the primary residence of the child is located. And they have to forward this report within 30 minutes. And then the county must acknowledge receiving the report. Once they have the report, CPS must begin an investigation within 24 hours. What they do in those first 24 hours may vary a bit depending upon the nature of the allegations, but no matter what the allegations are, they must begin an investigation within 24 hours. Once they've started their investigation, they must meet with the parents and children in person in their home. They must interview every family member involved. They can also, of course, interview lots of other people, including the neighbors, other relatives, and teachers. And they're going to gather a whole bunch of evidence that either supports or refutes the allegations. And regardless of what they need to get done, within 60 days, they must make a decision. And their decision choices are indicate or unfound. We're going to talk just briefly about family court and criminal court before we finish up the lecture. CPS also has the option of bringing a case to family court. We talked about in an earlier module about the county bringing a case. This is what it would mean, the county bringing a case to family court. So if the allegations are serious, meaning severe physical child abuse or sexual abuse, they're going to bring a case to family court. They may bring a less serious case, such as a case involving educational neglect or lack of medical care or lack of supervision, if CPS cannot get the parents to resolve the problem or they can't get the parents to actively participate in services that relieve or alleviate the problem, 
In either of those situations, the county may file a neglect or abuse proceeding against the parents in family court. And the standard they have to meet is proving neglect or abuse by the exact definitions we studied in Module 9 and Module 10. It's that definition of neglect and it's that definition of abuse. It's critical to note that family courts are civil courts. They are not criminal courts. They are civil courts. So regardless of what the county proves the parents did or didn't do, the judge can't send them to jail. These are civil courts. So if they can't send them to jail, what the heck can they do? Well, there's a number of things they can do, and these are some of the common sanctions. So they can order a parent to participate in services. We talked about that a minute ago where CPS is required to offer services, but if they want to force a parent to get services, they have to go to family court and get a court order. So the court can order a parent to participate in services. The court can require a parent to be tested and evaluated for drug and or alcohol abuse. The court can order a parent to obtain services for one or more of the children. As you know from our modules on domestic violence, the family court can also issue an order of protection. They can issue stay away orders of protection. They can issue refrain from orders of protection. Family court can also place a child in foster care. This of course can't happen unless there's a hearing, but it is one of the things the family court has the jurisdiction to do. The family court after a hearing can also place a child in a residential care facility. Of course, they can hold hearings, which are like trials, to determine if a parent has neglected or abused the child. Family court can also require parents to only have supervised visitation, meaning they can't have contact with their children unless someone else is there supervising them at all times. And the most serious thing the family court can do is to terminate a parent's rights. This is extremely rare. Family courts and CPS and Department of Social Services will work with families for years sometimes to try to get them to keep them together or to reunite them if the children have been placed in foster care. So there are situations though where parents are incapable of caring for their children and they've been given multiple opportunities to obtain services, to make changes, to do whatever it is they need to do so they can safely take care of their children. And if they cannot, sometimes, unfortunately, the only resolution is to terminate their parental rights. But I can assure you this is a very rare occurrence and it also does not happen quickly. This happens over a period of years. So for example, if a CPS worker brought a sexual abuse case to the family court and the judge put the child in foster care, that proceeding determining what's going to happen with that child may take four to six or even eight months. The child may remain in foster care if the parent is willing to get services. So that's going to take some time for that parent to do what they need to do to convince the court the child could be returned to them. And it's only after the parent has had multiple opportunities to do that, that it's even considered to terminate a parent's rights. So that's the least common thing that happens in family court. The most common thing that happens in family court is parents being ordered to participate in services and or parents being issued orders of protection. Those are the most common things that happen in family court. Criminal court, we talked about briefly with the case of Michael Valva and Angelina Polina, our parents from Long Island who are facing charges regarding the uh, child with autism who they let die from hypothermia. You remember this case. In very serious allegations, CPS is communicating with law enforcement at the beginning of an investigation. Now, of course, they don't involve the police if it's alleged somebody hasn't been going to school. But if the allegations, if a child has been severely injured, a child requires medical treatment as a result of injuries inflicted by a parent, 
If a child's been sexually abused by a parent or the parent has allowed another person to sexually abuse the child, the police are going to be involved with that investigation early on. That's why we have things like the interview room at the Child Advocacy Center, so police officers can observe those interviews. There's a number of criminal charges a parent could face for abusing their child, ranging from murder, manslaughter, aggravated assault, sexual abuse. There's many crimes a parent could face in criminal court. And of course, we know criminal penalties range from getting probation to a life sentence in prison and everything in between. So we have sanctions that can be issued against parents from family court, which is a civil court. And then of course we have criminal sanctions that can only be issued by a criminal court. That's the end of part two. So here's what's going on for the rest of the module. You have a project this week, but I think you're gonna like it. It is a writing assignment, but it is not a formal essay. There's still some rules. So see the module for details. You have two media items. There is a CBS national news story on CPS caseworkers. There's two videos in that article. One is a six minute video and one is a four minute video, but I think they're really well done. The first video focuses on CPS caseworkers. The second video focuses on CPS supervisors. The article around it is just a transcript of the video. So if you watch the videos, you don't need to read the article. In the media section, you're also going to see an Albany County CPS caseworker job posting. I want you to look at that carefully because that's also related to your project for the week. And you have an opportunity for extra credit. There's no quiz this week and no textbook assignment and no article. If you have any questions, please send me an email. Thank you.